Hello and welcome to Project Oneness World. Today we're in conversation with uh, Professor Thomas Daniel Wilson, popularly known as Tom Wilson, Professor Emeritus at the University of Sheffield, England, and one of the foremost names in the information science field. He has worked in the field for 60 years, contributing renowned research in the topics of uh, information behavior uh, and information management. And every student of information science would have read Wilson's models of information behavior. I read them in 2006 when I was doing my PhD at the National University of Singapore. And since then, they have been an important part of several of my publications. So this was a book of mine uh, that came out in 2018 called Exploring Context and in Information Behavior. And uh, as you can see, like Wilson's model, one of his models uh, finds a place in this book as well, because any book of this kind would be incomplete without uh, Professor Wilson's uh, models. Professor Wilson has engaged in teaching and projects in several universities and institutions around the world, including in Portugal, Sweden, Finland, Morocco, Tunisia, and the US. In 2017, uh, he received the Award of Merit, the highest award from ACIST, the Association for Information Science and Technology that recognizes sustained contributions to the information science field. And very recently in 2020, he received the uh, the Jason Faradin Award from the UK e Information Group of, uh, of Philip, which is the, the UK equivalent of the American Library Association. And uh, these are just two of uh, among several awards that Professor Wilson has received over his career, uh, including a, a year 2000 Alisa Award for Professional Contribution to Library and Information Education, and again, uh, an award uh, by the ACES uh, Special Interest Group. Uh, on, on SIG use, on outstanding contributions to, the, to information behavior. And uh, Professor Wilson, uh, among various other things that he has done, um, he has uh, edited two leading journals uh, in information science, and he founded these journals. And this included the Social Science Information Studies, which in 1985 became the International Journal of Information Management, and also the highly reputed information research, which is still edits today. And I can vouch that how difficult it is to get something published in information research because of the very high quality that the journal adheres to. And once you have something in information research, I think it's one of the highlights of your career. And Professor Wilson's uh, positions over the years include uh, librarian and information officer at the Nuclear Research Center of uh, CA Parsons and Company in Newcastle upon Tyne, England, principal lecturer, Department of Librarianship, Newcastle upon Tyne Polytechnic, which later became the University of Northumbria, a visiting lecturer at the University of Maryland, US, a visiting professor at the Leeds University Business School, senior professor at the, at the Swedish School of Librarianship and Information Science. And Professor Wilson was the head of Department of Information Studies, which is the US equivalent of Dean at the University of Sheffield for 15 years. Apart from his PhD from the University of Sheffield, uh, Professor Wilson has two honorary degrees from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, and from the University of Mauritius, Spain. It's a huge honor for me to get to talk to Professor Wilson today. So uh, thank you so much and welcome Professor Wilson. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Professor. So I'll start with uh, my first question. Can you, can you tell us about uh, your story in your own words? You mean my entire life story? <laughs> Yes, your entire life story. Oh, my pro professional life story. I think your life, your life story, as, as you have found, including your professional life. Uh, well, um, I was born on a little rural railway station in County Durham in the northeast of England. Uh, my father was uh, what was called a plate layer, which was basically a railway labourer uh, tending to uh, the track in over a particular length of, of line. And he then became a, a track walker, which meant walking down uh, six miles of track in one direction, and then on a different line, another six miles back in another direction, and uh, catching the bus home. And on the next day, he would catch the bus to, uh, to Durham City, walk down the line for six miles and then six miles back up to, uh, to home. 
and uh, unfortunately he was he was killed at work by a train um, in 1953, um, which was quite a, um, a significant event in in one's life, as you can imagine. Uh, particularly, you were 18 at that point. Yes, at the time I was uh, I was 18, and I was just uh, a few. A few months into my national military service in the in the air force, so uh, it was um, a somewhat difficult uh, time. Um, before before doing national service, of course, I had uh, left school at the age of sixteen and uh, obtained a position as a library assistant in Durham County Library. Um, and uh, my education as a librarian was interrupted, if you like, by two years of military service. Um, but uh, following, following that, um, I attended what was then called library school at uh, Newcastle College of Commerce, uh, which prepared students for the examinations of the Library Association. Right. which were the dominant means at that time of becoming a professional librarian. At that time, there was only one university school of librarianship in the UK, which was University College London. And that was entirely postgraduate. So you, uh, you had to have uh, an undergraduate degree to get entry to, to that school. And since I'd left school at 16, well, obviously I didn't have <laughs> an undergraduate degree. Um, however, um, following military service and going back to the uh, Durham County Library and then undertaking a one-year program for in librarianship at the Newcastle College of Commerce, I moved on to become a college librarian of a... Uh, Technical College in the south of the county of Durham. Um, and then I moved into industry and became what would now be called information manager for the Nuclear Research Centre of CA Parsons and Company. Um, and which, which year was that? Which year? Yeah. Um, oh, that would be, I think, uh, probably 1959. Right. Yes, uh, long before you were born. <laughs> yes, and, and, and a year before my parents got married. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so we're talking about a long time ago. And of course, um, at that time, the, uh, the work of an information manager or special librarian, as we were called, um, was very different from what, to subsequently taken place because, of course, everything was in print form. And uh, carrying out literature searches meant getting the abstracting journals and uh, searching through the abstracting journals, then using interlibrary loan to borrow the journals and uh, a much more tedious process than, uh, than happens today. And going to Google Scholar or going online and finding that. Right. And, yes. But it was a very, um, it was a very exhilarating time uh, to be involved in that particular industry because uh, a lot was happening uh, in the development of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And um, the, uh, the environment of a, an industrial research centre meant that you were really uh, on the research front in developing that particular industry. And uh, people were uh, enormously grateful for the work that the information department did because it saved them enormous amounts of time and very often uh, brought to their attention uh, things that were of benefit to the research, which otherwise they would not have come across. Mm -hmm. I, I remember on one occasion, this <laughs> scientist um, who had been trying to find a way of producing 
absolutely spherical balls of graphite. And um, I had found him information on this, and he, he dashed into my office one day, hands all black with graphite, face smudged with graphite, um, to thank me for the information I'd found because it had finally enabled him to produce absolutely spherical balls of graphite, uh, which were needed to pack the fuel rods that went into the nuclear reactor. And the spherical shape of them gave them more surface area to, uh, to um, benefit the, uh, the fuel rod in effect. Mm -hmm. right. On another occasion, um, I saved the organization, must have been several thousand pounds by discovering that uh, somebody in the uh, engineering department looking at fluid flow in pipes was engaged on exactly the same subject as somebody in the electrical engineering department. And uh, I put the two of them together and of course uh, they were able to collaborate and, uh, and uh, develop something, uh, something quite original. And this was largely due to the fact that my boss at the time was a very well-known uh, scientist, uh, Dr. Monty Finiston, who subsequently became head of British Steel and became Sir Monty Finiston, um, who I was actually appointed before he was appointed. <laughs> but when he arrived, he had me into his office to talk to me and he said that he expected me to spend a third of my time out in the laboratories talking to people to ensure that I knew what was going on because only by knowing what was going on would I be able effectively to help people. Right. And uh, so that's how this, this came about by, by being there and finding out what was going on and enabling people to work together. So that's um, the information need in your information behavior model. It, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would be. Well, my information behavior was certainly, um, would certainly fit the model, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, uh, but the, of course, the behavior of the scientists and engineers involved was, um, was radically different from the way it is today because um, they depended much more on the information service than scientists and engineers do today who can carry out their own literature searches quite effectively. Yeah. Um, and I think that's reflected in the decline of the special library sector in the library information world. Um, the uh, organizations now use their information systems departments to provide information services to uh, their staffs, their research engineers and so forth. Yeah. And um, although there may still be a need for engineers, for intermediaries, that need I think is not often recognized and yeah. probably people spend a great deal of time wasting time whereas a trained information specialist could in fact uh, help them more effectively. And especially with disinformation coming in I think it's the people need help to find what is correct information and what is false information. Oh, uh, yes absolutely absolutely um, but that's a whole other issue which yes. we better not get into. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's quite a problematical area. Yes. So after working for about three years in the Nuclear Research Centre, um, an opportunity arose to uh, go into teaching in the library school at Newcastle. Um, from my time there, I'd always thought um, that it might be a possibility for me. And so uh, the opportunity arose and I applied and I finished working in the Nuclear Research Centre five o'clock on a Friday night. And I started working in the library school, teaching 23 hours a week at nine o'clock in the morning of Monday. Yes, so, I saw that you, I read that you had a week's notice that you needed to, to, to give. 
Right, yes, yes. But in fact, I, I didn't have a week of free time. <laughs> I just moved from one job to another from Friday to Monday. And um, over the course of my career, I taught just about everything um, that there was to teach in the syllabus um, in one way or another. And uh, I decided that, you know, if, if I was going to have any sort of academic career, then I would need educational qualifications beyond what I already had, which were absolutely minimal, right? <laughs> they were good enough to get me a job as a library assistant, but they wouldn't have got me into university, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So I started working uh, to improve my educational qualifications by taking what were then called advanced level general certificate of education. And how old were you then when you started doing that <coughs> studying again? Well, how old was I? Let me see, probably 25, 26. Okay, yeah. Uh, something like that. And uh, eventually I passed those examinations and started to do a, um, an external degree of London University, which was possible at that time. Um, They've since abandoned that because of the existence of the Open University in the UK, which is now the principal means whereby people acquire degrees by part-time study. Um, the university was not very helpful <laughs> to its external students. Uh, all you got was the, the reading list and the syllabus. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and it was up to you to go ahead and do the reading. <laughs> and take the examinations, which I, which I ultimately did. It took me about five years because, of course, I was working full-time uh, at the same time I was doing this. And um, I think it was probably 19, what? Oh, I don't know, 19, 1969, 70, when I uh, got my first degree. So I'd be well, 35. Yeah. Um, and then quite fortuitously, um, I received an invitation to teach at the University of Maryland. Um, the then dean, Paul Wasserman, a, a well-known name at the time, um, had this conviction that uh, classification was not well taught in the USA. Uh, there were stories of lecturers or professors coming into class, reading the schedules of the decimal classification and leaving again. Right. Um, whereas in the UK, um, the work of Ranganathan and faceted classification <coughs> had achieved a stronghold. So there was more of a a theoretical tradition of teaching classification. And Wasserman was aware of this <coughs> and um, invited a series of uh, British teachers to teach uh, the subject at the University of Maryland. And I was, uh, I was one of these. And uh, that, was, that was quite an education in many ways. <laughs> This was 1970, 71. Now in 1970, there had been race riots in Washington right. and shops and stores on F Street had been burned down. Right. Uh, there'd been uh, a demonstration. Uh, the main route north out of Washington ran through the university campus at the University of Maryland. Uh, there had been a demonstration which interrupted traffic for hours in 1970. And there was a repeat of this in 1971. I wisely stayed home on that day because otherwise I would probably have been tear gassed. Yeah. <laughs> because tear gas was used pretty indiscriminately by the, uh, by the police to, to break up the demonstration. So this was uh, a rather interesting um, interesting introduction to the political culture of the USA, shall we say. 
And that was uh, the first, first trip to the, to the US from the UK? Um, no, I'd been, uh, been before, uh, 1963, um, the Association of Assistant Librarians in the UK, which was then a section, a special section of the Library Association, organized a study tour to the USA. And we stayed with librarians in uh, Boston, Washington, and New York, uh, visiting libraries and library schools and so on and so forth in this period. So I'd been before, and I'd been back again probably about 1968. So did, you, did you come to Simmons as well during your study tour? Um, not to Simmons, no. Not, uh, not on that Boston trip. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, don't think we visited, no, it was mainly libraries we visited in Boston, yeah. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was also an education in other ways because the, uh, the faculty at that time in the school at the University of Maryland was absolutely riven by interpersonal disputes and disputes about the budget and its allocation and so on and so forth. And the atmosphere was so, so dire that um, I was asked to be the chairman of the Curriculum Development Committee because nobody trusted anybody <laughs> to be in this role. <laughs> We had uh, the Black Students Caucus uh, parading through the uh, faculty building, um, uh, chanting slogans against the then acting dean. Uh, staff meetings, faculty meetings were rife with abuse. <laughs> <Right. laughs> it was really a complete education in academic politics. <laughs> and and I, I guess in keeping calm as well, in some ways. Sorry? In keeping your composure through this. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, yes. So that was, um, that was uh, shall we say, formative in, in my career. I, uh, I learned then how not to manage a department. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, that stood me in good stead subsequently. Um, yeah, it was it was a very enjoyable time, in spite of the in spite of all of the uh, the aggro that went on in the actual faculty meetings and so forth. And I made very good friends there. Um, most of them have now gone, of course, but. Um, they were, it was it was a good a good time a good experience, um, and when I went back to Newcastle, I had only been back for about three or four weeks when the head of the school at Sheffield, Professor Will Saunders, uh, rang me up and said, uh, "Would you like to come and take charge of a research project?" Well, this could be completely out of the blue. I mean, <laughs> I, I developed some research experience because, of course, uh, my degree was in uh, sociology and economics, so I, I knew statistics and uh, research methods and so forth. So, um, and I'd done little bits of personal research uh, while I was at, at Newcastle. Um, but he invited me to be principal investigator on this uh, research project. Uh, so I said, well, you'd, you'd better have a talk with, with Bill. This was my head of department, Bill Caldwell, um, about this, because I've just got back from America, a year's leave of absence to go to America. And he said, oh, it's okay. I've already had a word with Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so having arrived back home in September, uh, in January, I found myself as principal investigator on a local library cooperation project at the University of Sheffield. Right. 
funded by the then Department of Education and Science. And the, uh, the, un the backstory or the, the hidden agenda of the Department of Education was that they suspected that with um, several large libraries in a city, there must be sufficient degree of duplication of resources to enable savings to be made. Now, this uh, this was never actually spelled out. <laughs> and they were looking for a consolidation. The <laughs> okay. yeah. But um, the um, what I mean, we found precisely the opposite that the. Uh, the, the institutions, where we started off with the university, the polytechnic, the city libraries, uh, the Institute of Education and two teacher training colleges. By the time we'd finished after two years, uh, the two teacher training colleges had merged with the polytechnic and the Institute of Education had merged with the university library. Okay. <laughs> so... Starting out with five or six, we ended up with, with three. And we did various studies, uh, a, lot of, a lot of separate investigations, some of them into information needs of uh, the academic staff of the two academic institutions, um, a study of reference library uh, interactions in the city reference library. Um, we did uh, catalog comparison studies, uh, doing um, sample studies of the contents of catalogs to determine the degree of duplication that existed in, in the stocks of the libraries. Right. We did all kinds of things in these two years of uh, investigation. And in addition to doing things in Sheffield, I also did uh, subsidiary investigations for my own purposes in two other cities. And so I was able to use the data from these three investigations in my PhD, which uh, Professor Saunders had suggested I should undertake about a year into the into the investigation, he said, it would be, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea for you to base a PhD on what you're doing here? So this was uh, quite a, um, quite a, um, what shall we call it? Quite a radical introduction to library information research coming from absolutely nowhere mm -hmm. and uh, carrying out a directing and carrying out uh, a two-year research program involving all of these libraries and uh, with a staff of uh, uh, three other people working with me on, on this project and costing several tens of thousands of pounds over the, over the period. So that was also a formative um, kind of influence because uh, you know it introduced me very thoroughly to uh, to the research process and um, completing the PhD about six months after the project finished um, and also publishing a little introduced me to the scholarly publication process and so on. Although that wasn't really as significant then as it is now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, there was no real pressure to publish uh, at all. Uh, you know, you, academic staff might publish one or two papers a year, and that would be... Uh, somebody no. in the humanities might take five years to publish a monograph, and that was fine. Right? So there was no real pressure at that time to, to publish, I mean, or to gain research funds um, because the, the national funding from the government was largely sufficient to, uh, to run the system. Right. Of course, that all changed radically 
I mean, there was so little pressure to get research funds that for, oh, I don't know, for 10 years, perhaps, this little department of uh, 68 people, uh, Department of Library and Information Science, Library, Librarianship and Information Science, um, was regularly the second or third highest in research income earner in the university beating science departments and engineering departments in the amount of money it got. Well, you know, completely inconceivable today. I mean, it would be impossible. But the external pressure to do these things wasn't there. And therefore, people had a relatively rax time. They probably were better teachers as a result, not having the pressure to undertake research and get the research money. And uh, so it was a very different time from what uh, subsequently emerged. And do you think uh, having that, not having the pressure was good compared to the current scenario? With the way oh, absolutely. I think that um, universities in the UK have become highly stressed environments in which to work. Um, the, the rate of serious illnesses of academic staff, for example, has increased enormously. Um, time off for health reasons has increased enormously. People are put under such pressures that it really is quite ridiculous, quite ridiculous. And detrimental to the mission of the university, obviously. And there is no need to, right? Because without pressure, if the system could create Tom Wilson, then Sorry, you, this, you, so if the system could create Tom Wilson without the pressure, so we don't <laughs> need the pressure. Right, yes, yes, we don't need the pressure. We don't need the pressure. The pressure came on later when I became head of department, uh, when Wolf Saunders retired, 1981. Um, and I became... My colleagues voted me into the position and I assumed I would do it for a year and um, then, you know, the university would appoint someone. And they carried out a search and uh, invited applications and decided that um, on the first year they, they couldn't find anybody. And then in the second year they couldn't find anybody. So I was asked to continue in the role. And then in the third year they changed the rules and uh, under pressure from the Association of University Teachers. Right. Uh, the Association of University Teachers had become concerned at the behavior of some heads of department because heads of departments were appointed basically for life. Right. And some of them became petty tyrants. <laughs> 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 this right. is... This is not unknown in academia. Yes. Um, so the, uh, the association, which was in effect the lecturer's union, uh, campaigned to have the head of department elected from among the senior staff of the department. So my colleagues asked me <laughs> if I would take on the first term of three years having already done the job for two years, they then asked me to do it for the further, for the three. So I said, okay, okay, I'll do it for another three, fine. Uh, but then the problem was that having done it then for five years, when the next election came around, they asked me to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and to cut a long story short, I ended up doing it for 15 years. Um, and, um, Fortunately, I was able to carry on teaching and researching for most of that period. Um, it was only towards the end when the, the pressures began to get rather too uh, difficult that I had to uh, give up the teaching that I'd been doing. I hadn't been doing a lot, perhaps three or four hours a week, but um, the stresses introduced by the Thatcher government Right. into British universities, um, the cutting back of funding. I think we lost 20% in funding uh, 
in the first year that I was head of department. And in, you know, in a sizable university, that's quite a lot of money. That is the 20%. And uh, so we were continually urged to make everything a priority. <laughs> mm -hmm. We had to have a priority in increasing student numbers, increasing research income, increasing consultancy income, increase, increasing short course income, and so on and so forth. And um, everything was a priority. There was no, you had to do everything. So cost cutting might be one good way to increase faculty pressure, right? In yes. the sense of when you cut costs and then you bring in the pressure for people to do more with less. Yes, yes, absolutely. We were, we were doing continually more with less. And I, I saw that the only way out of this problem was to grow the department because um, we had twice been looked at for possible merger with other departments or closing down, which I'd managed to fight off. Um, and it was obvious that we had to, we had to grow because when I took over, we had uh, eight and a half members of academic staff, including myself. So we embarked upon uh, a program of developing new master's degrees. Um, we developed a, an MSc in health informatics jointly with departments in the medical school. Right. And we developed an MSc in information systems jointly with the Department of Computer Science. Um, we taught an information management option in the MBA program with the business school. Um, we developed two undergraduate programs. We'd previously been entirely postgraduate. We developed two undergraduate programs, one in financial information management with the business school and one in general information management on our own. Um, later on, uh, after my time, the, uh, the school also developed a master's in um, chemo informatics. And it's gone on to develop specialized programs in other fields, for example, in MSc in data science now. Yeah, so we were an I school before the I school concept emerged. <laughs> <laughs> um, not before the one in Syracuse, which was probably the original high school, but um, before the concept was, uh, was mooted. Um, and that enabled us to grow because we increased student numbers. Um, and by the time I left uh, the position of head of department, we'd grown from uh, eight and a half members of staff to 15 members of staff. That was in 1997? 1997, yes, yeah. and um, it's since then grown to uh, 30 academic staff. So that strategy of diversification um, has, has paid off considerably. Um, and uh, without it, we, you know, the department would not have survived. It, uh, you, you saved it, I think. Yeah. Sorry? You saved the department, like the department got saved. In oh, I, I wouldn't say I saved it. <laughs> Collectively, we saved, right. yes, yes. Yeah. Um, because, you know, a, a head of department can only do so much. Everything depends upon uh, the support you have to do things. Right. And if you don't have that support, you can shout and scream as much as you like. Yeah. And <laughs> nothing, yeah. will, nothing will happen. Um, so yeah, it was a, a collective, a collective effort, and uh, because the system was that you had to have the student numbers before you got the increase in staff, it meant that people, my colleagues, well, and I were working very, very long hours in order to to accomplish this uh, until additional staff could be appointed. So it was uh, it was very much a collective effort. Mm. So that brings me up basically to retirement in 2000. Yeah. And since retirement, you have not been 
free at all is what I can see. <laughs> you, <laughs> you have been busy in, in various ways. No, well, um, this is largely due to, to former students to a certain extent. Um, one of my PhD students, Dr. David Allen, now at Leeds University Business School, invited me to be visiting professor at Salford University when he was there, yeah. basically to help him develop the information management program. And then it leads to develop a research group and to jointly supervise PhD students with him. In um, Portugal, we had a long association with, with uh, Portugal, which, is, uh, which was interesting in its own, in its own right, in that um, at some point in the 1980s, I guess, late 1970s, 1980s, I was asked to participate in a, a consultancy um, program on the place of public libraries in Portugal, which introduced me to a number of players in, in the field. And, one, and we, we carried out work. The position of public libraries was very dire in Portugal at that time. There were basically only three or four major public libraries in the entire country. And uh, in some places, the only collection of books was in the local fire station. <laughs> <laughs> and there were other community centers where the um, Goldbankian Foundation provided boxes of books on a regular basis, um, kind of library ex book exchange system in some of the towns and villages. Um, so we made recommendations, which nobody took any notice of for, <laughs> yeah. for several years. But then, oh, I don't know, about 15 years later, uh, the government actually decided to do something about it and began to implement the proposals that we had set out a considerable time before. Um, and as part of that, uh, part of that study, uh, I met the... Uh, Chief Information Officer of uh, the National Laboratory for Science and uh, Technology. Uh, the uh, Portuguese acronym was LANETI. And uh, she obtained funding to develop a program for training um, information intermediaries in the Chambers of Commerce in Portugal. So with colleagues in Sheffield, uh, we ran that program for, I think, a couple of years, producing information specialists to work in the Chambers of Commerce. And then um, we ran our MSc in Information Management program at Lunetti, not in an educational institution, but at Lunetti, uh, for two intakes. We extended... Uh, the, the time of the degree from 12 months to 18 months. Mm -hmm. And we had local assistants in Lunetti providing guidance, already trained librarians, information scientists, to help the students while the staff from Sheffield were not present. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of collaborative program that we, we were running funded by ultimately by the European Union because it was development money that Portugal was getting from the European Union that funded the funded the um, and it was the income from that uh, program that really kept the department in Sheffield afloat <laughs> for some time because um, the department got something in the order of um, 75% of the income, and the university kept 25%. Yeah, that's a lot, yeah. And without that, we, um, uh, well, attending conferences wouldn't have been possible and so forth. Right. 
So getting that money by running that program um, helped the department considerably. And of course, built up good relationships with, uh, with people in Portugal. Um, to the extent that one of the uh, students um, who was at that time, I think, librarian of the Department of Psychology at the University of Porto in the north of Portugal, moved to the Faculty of Engineering. And in the Faculty of Engineering, the Faculty of Engineering, curiously, was responsible for the MBA program in the university. Um, and the Department of Computer Science was part of the Faculty of Engineering. So she talked with uh, people in these departments and persuaded them that a master's degree in information science would be a good thing. <laughs> and then talked with me about Sheffield providing lecturers to develop and deliver the program, together with other people from the Faculty of Engineering. So I was involved with that for about 12 years, along with colleagues from the department. And um, uh, we produced probably, I think it was, when it started, it was the only program of its type kind in Portugal. Nobody else was teaching information management. Um, so it was very formative for the, uh, the profession, if you like, at that time. Because when other universities saw what was happening, they, of course, started producing competitive <laughs> programs yeah. for the one that was going on in Porto. Um, so, uh, and my colleague, David Allen, who was then at Sheffield um, as a lecturer, still travels to Porto a couple of times a year to deliver lectures in my program. Um, I got to the point where I was doing... Uh, you know, in a program like that, you have to be a researcher in order to uh, keep abreast of developments in the field and participate in developments in the field. Otherwise, you're teaching at second hand, you know, right. you're, you're reading the literature and trying to make sense of it. And, whereas if you're doing the research in the field, then you can deliver more convincing lectures, more yes. interesting lectures. More um, in-depth knowledge comes in by default. Yes, and I got to the point where I wasn't doing that kind of research any longer. So it was, you know, it wasn't really sensible to carry on. So David took over from me and uh, continues to this day. Um, so that went on after I'd retired up to about, uh, I don't know, 20, 2012, something like that. I was doing that. And before I'd retired, um, a colleague in Sweden whom I'd known for many years, uh, Professor Lars Herglund, um, invited me to be a visiting professor at the University of Boros, or as it was then, the Herg School of New Boros. And um, he was the professor of information science at the University of Gothenburg but he didn't have a department. He was just, he just had PhD students who were registered through some complicated agreement between Boros and Gothenburg. Mm. So that they studied in Boros, but their degree was from Gothenburg and Larsch was the only supervisor. Mm. And it got to the point where he had more than 20 PhD students that he was supposed to be supervising. <laughs> so uh, basically, he invited me to come and help him, <laughs> right. which is uh, which is how I came to be at, at Boros. And um, then I um, I was uh, jointly supervising one or two PhD students there, um, helping to develop a uh, an online program in digital libraries, digital library administration, we called it. Um, which continues today. <coughs> um, and for two years, I was uh, seconded from the department to be an advisor to the rector uh, because things were happening in Europe at the time, which um, Sweden had kind of not taken notice of. Um, 
and these this the principal one of which was uh, the so-called Bologna Accord, which established a common pattern of undergraduate masters and doctoral studies across Europe. Mm. And uh, the Swedish institutions thought they didn't need to change anything, and then rather belatedly discovered they did need to change anything in order to be comparable with the rest of Europe. So I was acting as an advisor to the rector to help him come to grips with this uh, this problem of the um, fitting in with the Bologna program. So that was quite an interesting time. (laughs) And uh, I learned quite a lot about um, institutional administration at that point, shall we say. Um, and I still continue to work for Boros because they now publish information research. I handed over ownership of the journal to them in 2017, and we're now busy trying to uh, convert the whole thing to a new version of OGS and operate it entirely within this new system. So. There are ongoing changes, shall we say. <laughs> and, and OGS is open to journal systems. About. Sorry? OGS is open journal systems, right? Yes, yes, version three of open journal systems. Yeah. Which in my opinion is I, I have this saying that um, updates often end in update degradation. And I think this is what has happened with version three. Things that were easy to do in version two are now difficult to do in version three. And I really can't see the point of making things more difficult in an update, upgrade. So, yes, so we're battling with some of the shortcomings of version three, which were easy to do in version two. So there we are, that's the, that's the, we're up to the present day now. Yes, I think, um, and I'm going to take you back again to your child, just to clarify a few points. So one is that you were born in 1935. I was... Born in 1935. That's right, yes. Yes, and uh, you were not born in a railway station waiting room. You've clarified that in an article. Sorry, I was... You were not born in the in a waiting room. No, no, not in a waiting room at the, <laughs> at the railway station. No, no, in my parents' home, a little so-called railwayman's cottage um, on the railway station yes yes and so when you think of yourself as a child right what was your childhood like what were the things you liked who were your friends what were your growing up years like well it was it was quite a solitary childhood because um um we're talking about the period of the second world war right Right. so uh, times were difficult food rationing, and so on and so forth. Um, The family next door, and I was very friendly with uh, their son, and we we played together as children. Uh, They moved sometime during the Second World War, and uh, the new people didn't have children. The other children in the station properties were younger than me, Right. Um, so, apart from school, um, I really didn't have friends locally. Right? Um, so, you know, because it was um, one mile from the nearest village in one direction and one mile from the nearest village in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there wasn't much incentive to... Uh, to, uh, to travel these distances and, uh, and mingle. Um, I did, uh, I was a member of the local miners' union cricket club okay. <laughs> <laughs> in one of these villages. Um, and so I, I used to practice uh, in the nets uh, there. Um, but it, it was quite an idyllic childhood. I mean, it was, you know, out in the countryside. We had large gardens where my father grew uh, red currants, black currants, raspberries, mainly cane fruit, gooseberries. 
occasionally planted potatoes. We had a dog, Laddy, which um, needed exercise. Um, you know, and in spite of the difficulties, my mother was a very good, a very good cook and uh, made the best of uh, what was available and uh, always seemed to manage. So it, it was quite uh, an idyllic childhood. I had no problems as a child at all. So, so what did you like doing when you were growing up, when you didn't have any friends? Like, what, what interested you? Oh, well, what was I doing? I was uh, stamp collecting, of course. Everybody did stamp collecting at that time. Mm -hmm. I collected stamps and uh, researched their values and so forth in Stanley Gibbon's stamp catalogue, a standard reference work on the subject. Um, I read a lot. Um, my, my father uh, had been, I wouldn't say he'd been well educated, but he'd been, you know, he was born in 1900. So he would have expected to leave school, I think, at uh, 14 at that time, right? And, uh, but his, uh, his parents, my grandfather was uh, a publican, kept a pub. And uh, he had uh, six brothers, no, wait a minute, four brothers, two died in infancy. Um, uh, so he had uh, four living brothers. And he was the one who was sent to a, a commercial education college. So he had a bit more education than would normally have been the case at that time. And he was quite a great reader. So we had quite a lot of books in the house for a working class family. So reading became one of my main occupations. Um, and... Uh, in the, in the mining village where I went to primary school, um, the county library service delivered boxes of books every so often into what was the domestic science laboratory of the primary school mm -hmm. with the cookers and so forth in it. And these boxes were opened up and you could borrow books. So when I discovered this, this was sort of seventh heaven because, you know, this was magical. The idea that you had these boxes of books to leave through and find things and discover things. So reading became, yes, quite a, quite a passion. And uh, I must have read thousands of books in my childhood. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, apart from that, listening to the radio, because there was no television, of course, at the time. Right. So listening to the radio and particularly to the classical music concerts that were broadcast. Um, when I was at grammar school, I uh, was taught the violin yeah. and became a member of the Durham County Youth Orchestra. And so I was uh, practicing violin and uh, we had, in my time there, we had rehearsals every Saturday morning in one of the schools in Durham City. And uh, our music director for the county was an enthusiast for English composers. And so in the County Youth Orchestra, we never played any of the classical composers. We played... Uh, Elgar, mm -hmm. um, we played um, Peter Warlock, uh, relatively little known, but interesting, uh, interesting composer. We, we, we played uh, oh, English composers, mainly of the 20th century. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> so in one concert, for example, we, uh, we delivered Elgar's Enigma Variations with the orchestra augmented by a couple of um, classical musicians from uh, full orchestras uh, to uh, help us along. 
so that was uh, quite uh, quite an interesting time. And uh, there's no experience quite like being a member of an orchestra and collectively producing a sound. You know, it's uh, it's quite it's quite a magical experience. And um, I, I can take over. I mean, there was one occasion we were in rehearsal. And the girl who was on the same desk as myself, looking at the same, uh, oh, what's it called? The same music, um, playing from the same music. Uh, the conductor called a halt at one point and she went on playing. She had in effect hypnotized herself uh. in the music. She was just lost in the music. And the um, the conductor warned us not to not to touch her, not to disturb her, but to just let it peter out. And then uh, one of his assistants came and, and took her away to you know give her a cup of coffee or something, okay. <laughs> <laughs> settle her down. But it sort of demonstrated uh, the the strength, the power of music, uh, the, the power that music can have. But I think it's also the, the power of connection, because when you collectively work towards something common as a group, mm -hmm. then you produce magic. Like Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, it's a, it's a collaborative, collective uh, activity. And the thing about being in an orchestra, it is so, uh, so intense. You know, it's uh, absolutely intense because everybody has to play the right notes at the same time. <laughs> and uh, this, of course, what the, the conductor does, he achieves that by through, through the rehearsal process. He brings about that, uh, uh, that magic of the performance. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so also in, from a childhood, so were you, the, were you an only child? Yes, 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 I was the only child. Um, in fact, I was the only grandson. Um, my mother was the second eldest of six daughters. Uh, only two of her sisters uh, had children, and they were girls. So I was the only, only grandson boy. in the family. And uh, curiously, my father was the youngest of seven sons born to his mother, she had no daughters. My right. grandmother had no sons. My grandfather had <laughs> no daughters. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. So it was interesting that the, the male gene seemed to dominate, <laughs> and I popped out. Right. <laughs> but I yeah. could equally as well have been, the female gene might have been dominant. Yeah, yeah. Because there was dominance in one side or the other of one of the genes. Absolutely, yes, yes, must have been. Mm. Yep. So you you spoke in quite a, quite a bit of length about your career, and in one or two occasions you mentioned uh, uh, chance or serendipity or being fortuitous, uh, but in some some ways in terms of things happening by accident, like for instance when you were called to lead a research project, mm -hmm. and and things like that. So what is uh, what has been the role of serendipity? And uh, and in, in the which led to important turning points in your career. Oh, I think so little in my career has been planned that uh, probably serendipity has been dominant. Um, for example, in the in the move to in the year I spent in Maryland, I. I know that I was invited because a colleague in another institution had recommended that, that I follow him, right? So I didn't do anything about, you know, setting this up at all. It just came entirely out of the blue. Right. And um, <coughs> the guy who recommended me didn't tell me that he recommended me. The, the invitation just came out of the blue. Um, the invitation to go to Sheffield came completely out of the blue. I didn't, uh, you know, I had no conception of, of being involved in, in research in that way. 
Um, and I think, I think um, the invitation came because another member of staff had um, been aware of my work and had met me at conferences. And I suspect that he had recommended me <coughs> to, um, to Professor Saunders. But I, I, yeah, I don't really know how, how that came about. Um, the research methods I used on the Innes uh, project were again a consequence of serendipity because um, I shared a house with another research project. This was during the, um, <coughs> the local library cooperation project. And I was um, thinking of, I'd been appointed to the teaching staff uh, at the end of the research project. Um, so I was looking for research ideas and I'd become interested in uh, social welfare uh, as an area of investigation. And um, I happened to be in the secretary's office one day and saw this book on the desk. And it was The Nature of Managerial Work by Henry Mintzberg. And I picked it up and started looking through it. And I said, when does it, it was from the British Library, you see, lending division, had to go back. So I said, when does this have to go back? <laughs> and the secretary said, well, you can keep it for a day or two, but well, we, can, we can ask for an extension. Because just in a quick flick through, I realized that the structured observation method that Mintzberg had used and his model of the dimensions of managerial work uh, would fit exactly what I was trying to do in social services departments, right? not with their managers, but with staff in general. Right? So that serendipitous discovery of Henry Mintzberg's book sitting on the secretary's desk <laughs> resulted in what was it, what, how many years? A five year research project? Costing more money than anybody could possibly get now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, serendipity. Serendipity about the, the course in Porto. You know, the, um, if this student from Porto, this librarian from Porto, hadn't made the move to the Faculty of Engineering, she might never have bothered to think of developing the master's program there. Mm. <laughs> so, yes, things, um, you know, happen by accident. And the, um, the trick is to take advantage of them. And uh, when looking at your career, if you had to pick four or five, uh, or maybe three to five important turns, or the most important, uh, parts of your career, what would those terms be? Well, I think uh, going to the University of Maryland was an important thing because it introduced me to um, an entirely different academic structure, uh, quite different from the, from the situation I was in at Newcastle. Right. Um, so that would be one. The second, obviously, is the move to Sheffield to uh, take on that uh, research project. Uh, the third would be getting the Innes project money and do, doing that research for, for five years. Um, becoming head of department, although I didn't want to. <laughs> right. um, would be a significant step. And uh, probably establishing uh, social science information research and then uh, International Journal of Information Management and getting involved in uh, academic scholarly publishing right. um, would be significant, which of course ultimately led to uh, producing uh, information research and running that for 20 odd years. Right. 
So those would probably be the key things, I think, in my career. Um, the other thing I think is that um, we were a very international department at Sheffield. Um, it's even more international now uh, than, than it was. So I think probably about 90% of the students now are from overseas in, in the department. Right. Um, but we always had uh, quite strong connections to the British Council, and the British Council was really active in the world. It's shrunk disastrously since, uh, and is now really nothing more than an educational program, English teaching, which is very sad. Um, but that involved us in developing courses for the British Council and uh, traveling to other countries to, to, to give courses under the auspices of the British Council. So that internationalization was yeah. another very formative uh, influence. Yeah. And uh, how would you describe the information science field and your own role within it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I think the information science field has always been in a state of flux, right? Yeah. Uh, there have been numerous attempts to define what information science might be, and none of them seem to agree with one another. <laughs> <laughs> so it is... Um, I, I think it's a field which is probably slowly disappearing. You think it's disappearing? Yes, yes. Because um, when it began, we're talking about it beginning more or less at the time I was working in the nuclear energy industry, right? right. When everything was print and people needed intermediaries to help them uh, find things. Uh, gradually, uh, computer access has taken over practically everything. Yeah. Special libraries have been dis have disappeared to be replaced by help desks in information services departments or information technology departments. And the, um, the market for the generic information scientist seems to me to have disappeared that the practice needs specialists of different kinds. And anybody now developing an organizational information infrastructure will do it on the basis of specialized information system packages. Mm -hmm. Very little in the way of uh, self-programmed resources, they buy in what they want and manage these systems. And they will have perhaps one or two people whom we might call information scientists who are there to help the users when they get into difficulties. Right. And I don't see that situation changing. Um, I think that um, information science will probably disappear over the next 20 years, perhaps shorter. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen the way that pretty well all information retrieval research is now in computer science departments. Okay, yeah. uh, 50 years ago, all information retrieval research virtually was in library schools in the USA. Right. Right. Well, apart from what was going on in commercial in industries where information research work was going on, like IBM, for example, uh, like the work of Calvin Lewis and people like that in industry. Right. Yeah. Such academic research as there was, was, was in the light. It's moved completely into computer science. 
information management has moved into business schools and information systems. Right. And now the, because information is now everybody's problem. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need an exclusive field, you're saying, because now everybody's the exclusive about field that it was. Exactly. It's now everybody's problem. Because um, it, this really came about with the introduction of, um, first of all, network computers based on mini computers, um, and then the PC network revolution. Right? Mm. So, so, and the development of the inter internet, or the development of intranets. <laughs> you, you know, you could see what's happening. Um, the, uh, the power is flowing away from the people who knew about print and it's moving towards people who know about computers. Right. So I, I, I see that shift as being inexorable. And um, well, you can see it now. I mean, if you look at the information behavior field, um, I, I, in the little book I produced, I, I mentioned that if you search for information behavior and cancer, uh, on the first page, there's no information science journal listed. Right. They're all in health and nursing and medicine. So health information behavior is now the province of the medical sector. Right? Yeah. And if you look at other disciplines, they are also interested in the information behavior of people working in their fields. And so you can't just look at uh, four or five journals in the information science field, you know, JSIS, JDoc, uh, Journal of Library Information Research, Information Research, and whatever, and expect yeah. to find everything about information behavior in those journals yeah. in there, right? It's scattered across a tremendous range of journals right. because information is now everybody's interest. And solving information problems is now every discipline's interest. Right? Mm. So I so, think that's, uh, that's irreversible. So you think if information science disappears, so it will be taken over by computer science or with other like information systems or other disciplines? Like what yeah, information system? systems, computer science, business management, um, uh, they all have uh, an awe in, in this pool. Right. And how would you describe your own role in the history of information science or in the information science field? Oh, I've never really thought about my own role in, in this. Um, Um, I, I suppose that uh, my 1981 paper um, on information needs and information seeking behavior, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that that paper probably helped to kick off uh, a growing interest in information seeking behavior. There wasn't an awful lot before that time. There was some, but, but not an awful lot. Um, and the other thing that, um, that I did was to popularize the idea of qualitative methods in uh, information research. Um, I did a tour of Canadian universities for the British Council in the 19, uh, what, 90s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking about project in this, about qualitative methods and so on and so forth. And in some places, there was downright hostility to the idea that qualitative methods could be used in information research. Because the model was still that of trying to replicate the physical sciences. You couldn't be a science <laughs> with a big <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unless you did it quantitatively. But of course, the quantitative research um, really didn't tell you anything, you know. Well, what does it matter how many journals a scientist subscribes to or which, 
you know, or which advertising, abstracting journals he uses. I mean, you know, the papers were full of that kind of data, numbers of things. But it didn't really tell you anything about why the person was searching or what they did with what they found, <laughs> things like that. Huh? Yeah. So my, my advocacy of qualitative methods um, was probably influential. I mean, I don't really know because I've never, <laughs> I've never tried to explore it. One of the things that I like doing is uh, drawing up models and frameworks. I think that comes naturally to me. And when I look at your models and the way you have come up with multiple models over the years and you keep enhancing them or refining them, how did it start? What got you to, to like this idea of drawing models? And Well, as, you know, as you know, there is a, a crude um, division of people into ver verbalizers and visualizers. Right. Um, you know, it's a crude, a crude split. <coughs> and whenever I take tests, I find I'm in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm equally verbalizer and visualizer. But uh, when drawing diagrams helps me to think about problems. That's basically it. Um, writing down a whole lot of text when I'm trying to think about a problem wouldn't wouldn't serve my ends particularly. You know, I have to try to visualize what's going on by producing a diagram. Right. So that's where it comes from. It's some innate cognitive structure that um, gets me doing this. And the other thing that I've noticed about diagrams and mo models and mental models of framework is that they are a reduction of reality in some ways. Yes, yes, yes. They, but they are not reality. No, 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 they're, they're not reality. They're, they're a representation of theoretical ideas about reality. Right. Yeah, so that's as close, as close as you can get. And this, of course, is why people produce different pictures for essentially the same phenomena. Right. Because, you know, they have different minds, they have different backgrounds, they have different understanding. And so for what is essentially the same process, you know, person accessing information resource, right. you know, that's it. That's, that's what it's yeah. about. <laughs> you will get different elaborations of that basic uh, problem. So, so while a person can refer to a model or get, be guided by it, they must know that it's just a guide, and then absolutely. they must. Re absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, it's uh, and uh, to bear in mind that the the boxes uh, indicate some generic phenomenon. You know, yeah. there's there's no attempt to get everything into the model. You know, if you wanted to get everything in the model, you'd have to have a piece of paper bigger than the surface of the earth. Right. Right. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, you, it's, an, it's impossible. So you, you put into the boxes generic terms, which, which the researcher can then investigate and elaborate. Right. Yeah. And so, so looking at uh, the people you described, uh, you talked about some people who influenced you or who were important in some ways. So now looking back, uh, who do you think have been the people who have influenced your work, influenced your life in significant ways? Oh. Well, I had a headmaster at primary school, Mr. Holmes, who'd been an officer in the First World War. And he said to, uh, I mean, little children, you know, um, don't call me sir, I'm Mr. Holmes. I don't have a knighthood. Uh, I'm not a knight. I'm Mr. Holmes. So ever after that, I've been reluctant to call people sir. <laughs> <laughs> because why should I why should I signify that I'm some way inferior to them? Right. Huh? Mr. Mr. Holmes, by that one remark, taught me about equality. 
Yes, and I think in the British system, and I, and I grew up in India with the British system is a big part of our growing up as well. Yes. So I think that, sir, is a big part of how you refer to teachers. And yes, 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 yes. Well, that's not something that Mr. Holmes wanted to tolerate. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a, a small, inf- but a, I think an important influence because... Um, you know, one of those uh, things that guides the rest of your life. Right. Um, who else? Bill Caldwell, my head of department at uh, Newcastle, who uh, um, who I suppose believed in me. I think I think he would have liked me to succeed him as head of department. <laughs> Um, but he, uh, you know, he made no objection when I asked for uh, study leave in order to go to the University of Maryland. Uh, he saw that if I came back with new ideas, he could benefit the, um, the department. And even when I got back and then immediately went off to Sheffield, he supported that. You know, he was extremely supportive, and um, uh, he could have could have said no on both occasions. Um, so that was really a major major influence because so he wanted he, uh, he wanted the best for you. Yes, 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 indeed. Um, and you know, there aren't many people like that around. <laughs> right. And he could have been very different. He could have made it difficult. He could have made it impossible. So that was, um, that's a major influence. Uh, Will Saunders at Sheffield for uh, inviting me there and um, uh, supporting me, encouraging me to, uh, to do a PhD, encouraging me to become predominantly a researcher. Um, right. So that was, he was a, a, another major influence. Then in a curious way, I think, um, Shiali of Amarita Ranganathan. Uh. <laughs> a name <laughs> familiar to you. Um, partly because of his uh, faceted classification work, which was, the, uh, the aspect of classification theory that actually got me to Maryland. Right? Mm-hmm. So it was because of my knowledge of his um, work that I was able to do that. But um, he actually visited the school at Newcastle in his retirement year. He did a tour of English library schools and he came to Sheffield and taught us for two days. Yeah. To such an extent that by the end of the second day, he'd lost his voice. Okay. <laughs> so seeing this um, very significant figure in classification theory at the time, um, it was quite a significant event. And... Um, yeah, it was... That was quite something special. Yeah, and uh, you talked about the thousands of having read thousands of books growing up, and I'm sure you read after that. So, if you have, if you had to pick one or two books that influenced you or helped you a lot, what would those books be? Well, when I was, I don't know, I must have been perhaps six or seven, something like that. And at primary school, this was um, during the Second World War, and the uh, bicycle shed in the school had been taken over for the waste paper collection because waste paper was collected during the war to repulp and recycle. And I was looking in there. My grandmother's house was just across the street from the school. So 
one evening I went back and prowled around this pile of paper, you see, and I came across this book. It had no cover and no title page. And part of the first chapter was missing. It had no back cover, no spine, no indication of what it was, you see. Uh -huh. But I picked it up and started reading it and became interested in it and, and took it home, you see. And I became a very, uh, well, what you, yeah, influenced there. I don't know whether that's the right word, but I took note of the two characters, two of the principal characters in the book. Mm. This was uh, Mrs. Do as you would be done by, and Mrs. Be done by as you did. Uh. And this was Charles Kingsley's The Water Babies. Uh. <laughs> hmm. And I think those two ideas of uh, do as you would be done by and be done by as you did <laughs> yeah. stuck with me from reading the book. So it was, um, it was an influence in that respect. So it was treating people the way you want to be treated. In some sense. Exactly. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And... Um, that's an important lesson that some people never learn, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, later, probably when I was perhaps 10 or 11, probably borrowed from the library, because when I went to grammar school in Durham, I, uh, I joined Durham County Library and used the branch library in the city. Mm -hmm where I subsequently worked for a while. And I came across a book by the naturalist Richard Jeffries, a children's book called Bevis, The Story of a Boy. Mm -hmm. um, this is quite a well-known book, but probably dropped entirely out of recognition now. Um, mm -hmm. But it was... Um, an adventure story on a small scale hmm. in that, um, I, I don't know whether, I can't remember now whether the, the boy was Bevis was on a farm, but he was um, in a house near to which there was what was obviously just a large pond. Right. But in his imagination, this was a sea. You know? <laughs> and he built himself a raft and wow. um, explored the boundaries of this uh, this magnificent ocean that was <laughs> that's the point outside his house, right? Um, and um, it was uh, yeah. I do, somehow the uh, uh, the author managed to convey the child's mind, you know, and. Uh, I could think the way Bevis thought. Right. Yeah. So that was, I don't know that it was particularly formative, but, you know, the, um, the memory of reading it and enjoying it has stayed with me the rest of my life. So it, it must have had some significant impact. Yeah. Mm. And when you think of incidents uh, across your life, um, what, what are the most significant things which had a big influence on you, like one or two incidents which had a huge influence on you in some ways? Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a difficult one, the things that have had most influence. Well, we've already talked about the people and the sort of events right. and the books. I'm not sure what's left. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think one incident was certainly a father's passing. Yes, yes. Well, that was yes. that, that was quite uh, quite traumatic. Um, but uh, you know, you have to, to a certain extent, uh, I was young enough to get over it. Right. Um, if that had happened when I was say thirty, twenty-five or thirty. Um, 
it might have been more difficult to cope with. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you're young, you're more psychologically resilient. And, you know, you can manage these things. So yes, that was, uh, that was a traumatic e event. Yeah, though I would think that you would, it would become easier when you're older as compared to when you're younger. Could you become? But, uh, it, it is easier to deal with loss when you are older, is it, than, than when you are... I don't know. I, I think it young. might be more difficult, actually. And more difficult, you think? Because uh, you've had more of the person. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, you've had more of the person. And, you know, it depends how close you are. You know, if you move away as a young man and, uh, you know, your family are in another city and so forth, then you aren't in day-to-day -day contact. And so there won't be the same impact. But you, if you live in the same place and you visit regularly, you have Sunday lunch and this kind of thing, then I think it must be very difficult the longer, yeah. Yeah. The longer it is, uh, you know, until you get to the age yourself where you, you might not live much longer. <laughs> No, that, yeah, that, that's, the, that's a different thing. I think mortality is something which especially people in the COVID times have thought about, I think, in some yes, ways. Yes, in the last yes, yes. Years. Well, there was a note of, who was it? There was somebody died recently, age 94. And his mother was still alive. Right. At a hundred and something. You think... What on earth does a mother do with a hundred and something when her son <laughs> dies earlier? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite, yeah. Uh, quite staggering. Right. And so, talking about uh, skills, uh, what are some key skills that you have developed uh, that helped you over the years? Some of the what that I've developed? Uh, key skills. Key skills, oh, hmm. well, I've always been able to write reasonably well, right? But um, I suppose I developed that, uh, that writing skill. I mean, I, tr I try to write in such a way that people can understand rather than obfuscate. Right. <laughs> and... Uh, in the social sciences, unfortunately, obfuscation is very often the key intention, it would seem. Um, yeah. But yes, I, I, try, I try to write well, and I've developed uh, that over time. Um, I was fortunate to do the, um, the London University BSc in economics, although my major subject was uh, sociology. And so I, I mean, I chose sociology deliberately because it seemed to me that library information research was a social research area predominantly. Um, and uh, learning statistics, at least to some level, and research methods, of course, was immediately useful um, when I uh, when I moved to Sheffield. Um, I haven't really developed my statistical skills uh, much beyond that, uh, but at least I know when I need a statistician, right. which um, which is, I think. Certainly, people need to be developed in our field. People need to to have that statistical understanding that they know enough to know when they need expert advice. <laughs> because things can go sadly wrong if they uh, they go off and do it unguided. Right. So those skills were have always been uh, useful because. Yes, if you were a researcher, well, what do you do? Um, oh, keyboard skills. Yes, yes. Um, when, I, uh, when I did my national service in the Air Force, I became a shorthand typist. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with a typical military logic, uh, they assigned me to shorthand typing training when I had 
scored more highly than anybody had ever scored before on the wireless operator test. <laughs> so having demonstrated I was the ideal wireless operator, they made me a shorthand typist. <laughs> um, and of course, those keyboard skills have been extremely useful ever since. Because, um, you know, I can type much faster than I can write by hand. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, when I was studying in India, uh, I went to a typewriting school for like nine months for an yes. hour every, every morning before school. So I, be, I learned to type really fast. And my dream was to buy a typewriter of my own. And right. then computers came in and then I never got to fulfill that dream. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes, I think... But um, yes, I think all school kids ought to have uh, touch typing lessons. I mean, it's just so necessary these days. And of course, it's more common in America than it is in the UK to teach these skills in high school. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but yes, I think that uh, that was the shorthand skill has long disappeared but it's long disappeared from practice anyway. I mean, I don't know how many people take shorthand any longer. You know? mm. People use dictating machines or they just do it themselves um, rather than new secretaries. And yeah, now they have the mics on the, on the phones where they dictate to. Yes, that. yes, exactly. And voice transcription programs. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, so... I'm not going to ask about your successes because I think we talked about them through your career, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask about uh, how the how have the hard times influenced your life purpose in some ways, or what were the specific hardships which which set you into the into the directions in which your life took. Mm. Well. I don't really think I've suffered anything that could be called hardship. As I said, you know, we, we were a very poor family. Uh, railway workers were not paid very high wages in the 1940s, 1950s. In fact, I, my father kept a diary from the age of about um, 30 onwards. And I have these diaries. And in it, he recorded his wages every week yeah. and outgoings, rent and cost of electricity, coal and so on and so forth. And um, I found that his uh, wages actually decreased during the Depression era, um, 1929, through to about 1935, 36, mm -hmm. and didn't achieve uh, the same level as, say, 1928 until about 1948. Wow. So it was a big trough in yeah. earnings. So uh, we were not a well-to-do family. Um, but as I say, my mother was a great provider and... Uh, if there were hardships, I think there were hardships that she and my father suffered rather than me and mm -hmm. probably protected me from hardship. And uh, since then, I've, I've never been out of work. And so many people are out of work at some point in their lives. Right. Um, so I've never really suffered any hardship. And I think it's, it has something to do with... Uh a way of looking at life as well, I think, because you you come across as a primarily positive person to me. So you would look, you'd find reasons to go along rather than look yes, at things. Yes, the glass is half full. Yes, yes, the glass is half full, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, I think I do have that um, that attitude. Yeah. But, but, you know, things have never got so bad. Right. But the glass has been half empty. Yeah, yeah. So it's all right for me to be like this because I, I haven't suffered hardship of any kind yeah no it's helped you i think it, it's helped you keep doing things which you continue to do now in the terms of like trying to contribute rather than to think of what you didn't get oh yes yes i mean you know i, I intend to keep going as long as i'm compass mentis I mean, right. 
people, as long as people are interested in what I do. Well, they will be. They will continue to back and vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> let, let us hope so. <laughs> yeah. So what is something you wish you knew earlier in your life? Um, wished I'd done something earlier in my life. What do you wish you knew something earlier? You wish you Hmm. No, I can't really think of anything. Okay. I can't. I can't really think of anything. I mean, uh, you know, I've I've taken life as it comes, and I've uh, enjoyed life generally. Um, I've had wonderful opportunities put in my way, and enjoyed them. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's anything that I would say, oh, I wish I'd done X, or I wish I knew Y, or whatever. No? Um, I don't really see much point in thinking like that. <laughs> let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's manage the present and cope with that. <laughs> yes, I think in some ways probably you have done things at every time which hasn't left you with regrets kind of thing. No, no, I, um, I, don't, uh, I don't regret um, anything. For, for example, I was invited to stay at Maryland. And about three years later, I was invited to uh, be a candidate for dean. And mm -hmm. I've been headhunted in other places uh, for deanships in, in the USA. Uh, but I've never regretted not following through on any of them. Yeah. And uh, so what are, what are some life principles uh, that you follow? We talked about one of them in terms of treating people the way you want to be treated. But what are some life principles or values that guide you? And some life lessons, maybe? Well, the, um, I was never driven educationally by my parents, right? Yeah. They, they never urged me to do more or whatever, right? Uh, they encouraged me, but, you know, they didn't drive me. They didn't want me to do things. And uh, uh, th their attitude was always, well, do your best. Right. <laughs> And I think that's um, that um, everybody should do their best. You know, you can't ask any more of a person than that they commit to something fully and do it to the, the best of their ability. If they're doing that, they're doing a useful thing for humanity. Hmm? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that I think would be my my primary value. Do your best. Yeah, that's a wonderful one. That's a good one, especially now when you see people trying to pressurize kids in various ways in trying to be comparing them to other people or putting them into some bucket of being a perfection in some ways. Yeah, yes, yes. It's, um, you know, it, it just it just damages kids uh, yeah. to have that kind of pressure on them yeah. or it damages them in one way or another. Um, maybe, maybe that should come in uh, university systems too, where people are simply recognized for doing their best and encouraged to do the best? Yes, I, well, I think, uh, well, it will depend on the institution, depend on the department, depend on the group that they're in. Right. Um, you know, some, some faculty are supportive of people, others are not supportive, some are envious of people, and, uh, you know, seek to uh, undermine them, and so on and so forth. There are all sorts of little interpersonal politics can take place and uh, that's bound to make people unhappy and uh, best thing to do is to try to keep people happy yeah, yeah. Well, that's wonderful and uh, what does happiness mean to you when you, when you talk of being happy hmm. being healthy and content with what one has That's, you know, basically it. You know, when you get to my age, if you're healthy, you're happy. <laughs> right. <Yes. laughs> because, yes. 
anything else is going to increase your unhappiness, probably. Yes. And when you talk about the age, you're, you're 86? So really? You're 86 now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, my father was born in 1937, so I figured he was two years yeah. younger to you. Right, right. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I know you, you have been working on a book, uh, and I, I read something about a book talk uh, recently by you. So what are your goals now? Hmm. Probably to carry on breathing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good goal. That's a good goal. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. No, I don't think I have any professional or research goals uh, left. Um, uh, the, the, the book you refer to is just a little, a little book about uh, my own research in information behavior field. <clears throat> and I've made it just open access because, uh, you know, I believe in the open access model. Uh, I think... Uh, Academia has been very remiss in not developing the open systems model with open access model within institutions. You know. And the fact that um, uh, commercial organizations are taking so much money out of the system right. uh, seems to me to be absolutely deplorable. And the fact that the solution to it is in the hands of academics makes it even more deplorable. Because if I single-handedly can produce one of the leading journals in the field, open access, just sitting at my computer and receiving submissions, getting them processed by my regional editors, well, mm. you know, who needs a big commercial organization to do this? You know, it's, it's, it's nonsensical that the scholarly publishing is still in the hands of the commercial publishers. Right. And it's interesting because I have uh, recently been invited to do a talk on open access. And, and in the meeting that we had, I talked about information research as an example of a journal, which is of high quality, is not a predatory journal that open access is often associated with, and to show that how open access can be a leading journal. Right, yes. And information yes. research being an example of that. Yes, it can be. And the problem is that, you know, it's the predatory journals that have given open access the bad name right. because uh, people associate open access with those journals. And right. they're basically just money-making schemes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that I've uh, held you on for quite, quite a while, but I have one last question for you. Is what mentoring advice would you have for people who might follow in your footsteps? Don't follow in my footsteps. Find your own, <laughs> find your own route, and pursue it. <laughs> find your own route. That is great advice, uh, Professor Wilson. Thank you so much, and it's been really wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much, Professor okay. Wilson. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Uh, uh, sorry, I've got a. Skype uh, signal popping up. <laughs> okay, um, okay. Uh, have, it's been very enjoyable talking to you, and uh, uh, I look forward to seeing it on the screen. <laughs>